The recreation phase demands letting go, resting, and having fun in order to attach again. This is often the most difficult phase for helpers, in my opinion. We are well suited to showing up and engaging in the empathetic attachment phase. We are well trained and want to do the work. We struggle a little with the felt separation, but generally the nature of our job requires it of us. But the recreation asks us to take care of ourselves, which we are often not very skilled at. In fact, many of us have learned to take care of others as a coping skill in life. Scovault likens this phase to the light switch in a room that is connected to a solar panel for energy collection. The switch needs to be off to collect energy and on to dispense that energy as illumination through the lights. We must find ways to turn our switch off, to refresh and recalibrate so that we can continue to turn the switch on when needed. If we do not take the time to recreate away from our work, we will run out of the energy required to do the work. The cycle of caring occurs in many ways. It can be considered for the entirety of a career. You enter into the career, you do the work, you leave the career, and then you take care of yourself. For a day's work, for a session with a client, you enter the session, you do the work, you end the session, you take care of yourself. In any of these time periods, there is an entering into the relationship, doing the work, releasing from the relationship, and a need for recreation of the self to engage again. Without the fourth phase, we are continually shortchanging ourselves and increasing the likelihood of burnout or compassion fatigue. So let's look at some definitions to orient ourselves to the problem. These vary by who is using them, and we often use them interchangeably, but I'd like to carve them out a bit for our purposes. Burnout can be experienced in any job. It's when you experience exhaustion, physical or mental, or significant distress due to low job satisfaction coupled with a feeling of powerlessness and overwhelm. It can cause feelings of frustration and overwhelm, but does not fundamentally change one's view of the world. Burnout is exhibited mainly at work and in relationship to work. This can happen to those in the helping profession on top of compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is specific to helping professionals and caretakers. It often develops slowly over time throughout one's career in a helping field and can lead to significant physical and emotional symptoms. It also eats away at our very core and the things that brought us to the work, empathy, hope, compassion. It has been described as the cost of caring, but when unchecked, it is too high of a cost. Compassion fatigue is exhibited in multiple areas of one's life, not just in work. When compassion fatigue sets in and is not addressed, we can move into trauma exposure response. Trauma exposure response is when the experience of external trauma becomes the internal reality and we react to almost any experience as if we are in danger. So this is when compassion fatigue and or burnout in a high trauma field shifts to being the way we look at and react to the world. I love this quote from Naomi Rachel Remen. She talks about that compassion fatigue is to be expected in the helping fields. The goal is not necessarily complete avoidance, but rather finding ways to monitor the level of fatigue and then to build in ways to reduce the effects on an ongoing basis. My hope is that those in the helping fields will begin to understand that to react to the things we see and hear that are traumatic is to be expected. It is normal and it is in fact evidence of our shared humanity. Compassion fatigue ultimately is a normal response to continued abnormal experiences. Trying to avoid it is like trying to walk through water without getting wet. It's impossible. We can, however, build in ways to support ourselves and each other as we walk through the experience of providing support to those who are suffering around us. Allowing for the grief about the things that happen in the world to wash over us and be healed through our attention and experience. By building in conscious awareness of the fourth phase of the cycle of caring, we can begin to mitigate and heal the effects of witnessing the suffering of others, allowing us to return again and again as helpers to heal the wounds of the world. Let's look at compassion fatigue a little more closely. There are some personality traits that make someone more likely to internalize vicarious trauma, such as being anxiety prone or having a more negative outlook in general, as opposed to a calmer, more even tempered personality. But there are also factors that are within our control. What makes it more likely that a helper will experience high levels of compassion fatigue? Being a witness to interpersonal violence versus random accidents, experiencing vicarious trauma more often, experiencing vicarious trauma along with stress in the personal life or a history of personal trauma, 
and a lack of a support system to help mitigate the effects of vicarious trauma. What helps to protect helpers against overwhelming compassion fatigue? Impersonal trauma, so trauma without an interpersonal aspect, less frequent exposure, life experience, supportive peers, and finding meaning in the experiences. Compassion fatigue affects us mind, body, and soul. So as it develops and becomes overwhelming, you can expect to see some physical, behavioral, and psychological warning signs. I'd like to share some of those with you. So physically, you may notice moving from being physically tired to actually depleted. Difficulty with your sleep, headaches, particularly tension headaches in the neck or upper back. Increase in colds or stomach bugs, just generally feeling unwell. Bessel van der Kolk, a pioneer in the treatment of trauma, recognized that the immune system is affected by our experience of stress in day-to-day -day life. As a result, we may see somatization or hypochondria. Neither of these are made up or not real. They are very real experiences of emotional suffering in the body. Somatization is when we are unable to mitigate emotional overwhelm, and so it's transmuted into the body. Basically, we can't deal with something on the psychological level, so it moves into our body for us to deal with it in that way. And a great resource about this is the book When the Body Says No by Gabor Mate. Hypochondria is an anxiety about physical ailments that may or may not be present. We're seeing more of this in the time of pandemic. When compassion fatigue is building to unsustainable levels, we may see an increase in troubling behaviors. So there's an increase in substance use, addicted behaviors like shopping or overeating, working, missing work shifts, anger in excess to what a situation calls for, a sense that no one else could possibly do this job, avoidance of interpersonal relationships, difficulty making decisions, memory issues, quitting jobs, or less attention to the work. And let me talk about the silencing response for a minute. The silencing response was defined by Eric Gentry and Anna Barnofsky in their research as traumatologists, and it's something that mental health providers are particularly susceptible to when experiencing compassion fatigue. The silencing response is defined as a reaction which guides the caregiver to redirect, shut down, minimize, or neglect the disturbing information brought to them. So when this is occurring, the helper will use unconscious tactics like changing the subject, avoiding topics, knowing that they'll bring up trauma, minimizing distress in others, having a feeling of wanting others to get over it, using dark humor, faking interest, or blaming others for their own circumstances. All of these tactics are subconscious and are meant only to shut down conversation before it leads into dangerous, overwhelming territory. Psychological warning signs of compassion fatigue include not just physical exhaustion, but emotional, avoidance of situations, insensitivity to others, difficulty in intimate relationships, hypervigilance or jumpiness, overwhelm related to strong feelings, positive or negative, a crumbling view of safety and kindness in the world, a reduction in our empathy, increase in cynicism, depression and hopelessness, and anger generally turns to resentment. Carl Rogers, one of the masters of counseling psychology said it best, I have always been better at caring for and looking after others than I have been at caring for myself. But in these later years, I have made progress, he said, at the age of 75. I'm hoping we can make progress in the earlier decades. Given that we need the helpers, the first responders, the ER staff, the counselors, the caretakers, and given that suffering and trauma are unlikely to ever completely disappear, what can we do? We work towards creating sustainability in those fields and providing an awareness of the need for self-care and community care for the helpers. We make room for healing ourselves so that we can continue to support others in their healing. The goal is to create healing within the helpers and within the helping system to maintain the work over time without burning out our helpers. We work towards sustainability through stewardship. Stewardship is the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Trauma stewardship, as laid out by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky in her book, Trauma Stewardship, is the overall practice of caring for oneself in order to remain effective at and to avoid the negative effects of caring for others. In forestry, we might look at stewardship of the land as caring for and improving the resource over time. In the helping fields, we must begin to care for and improve ourselves over time as we are the resource for those who suffer. Excuse me.
Sorry, allergy season. <clears throat> How do we build capacity for trauma stewardship and make the caring cycle sustainable? I would say we do that through compassion for self and others, empathy for self and others, understanding of values and purpose, self-knowledge and self-awareness. But how do we build those things? We begin with mindfully approaching our experiences, particularly in the fourth phase of the caring cycle. I'll give you a second to read these quotes while I take care of my allergy. <clears throat> so why mindfulness? Because when we are not mindful of our experiences, particularly the difficulty of engaging with, working with, separating from, and rebounding from the cycle of caring, we miss an opportunity to transform the experience. By beginning within ourselves and building interoception, which is the subtle sensory body-based feelings, <clears throat> we build our capacity to hold that healing space for others and to manage our reactions to their experience, thus creating the alchemy from which growth occurs. So let's start with a return to self. So this means increasing self-awareness, but how do we do that? So you learn to recognize your own stress signals, be in tune with the particular combination of physical behavior and psychological cues that mean you're heading into compassion fatigue. Assess your current feelings and the ways in which you're acting and reacting to others. Recognize that you probably do this healing or helping work because you had something that happened in your life that was traumatic. Know that this will affect which traumatic situations are more triggering for you personally. And ask yourself how you deal with anger, hurt, and resentment on an ongoing basis. Be curious, not judgmental or blaming. Have you created a balance between nourishing or sustaining activities and those which deplete you? Are you using tools like exercise, personal interests or hobbies, or a personal debriefing where you run through experiences and learn from them? Do you access a counselor to support you in the work, which is my personal favorite? And do you have a clear social support who can be available when you're struggling? And finally, what things might you be doing that actually serve to sabotage your self-care? Not enough time? Time is what it is, and we choose how to spend it. Do you spend time playing games on your phone to zone out when you could be using some of that time to create a mindfulness practice or to exercise? Do you rely on alcohol or other in-the-moment coping mechanisms rather than seeking out other supports? Playing games on the phone or having a drink at the end of the day can be non-problematic for some people as stress relief. But if they are the only thing you're using to deal with the difficulties you're encountering, they will become problematic. Take the time to create your own self-care plan. Develop your own scale of warning signs from the lists I shared earlier. What's a four for you? What specific symptoms show up for you? What's a seven? At what point do you need to implement more self-care strategies? I encourage you to do this in writing, spending some time thinking about what it looks like for you. Then create a regular check-in. This might be monthly if you're dealing with fewer traumatic situations and more frequently if you're working as a helper. It may change depending on your stress level. Consider over what you have control, influence, or concern. If you have control, do something. If you have influence, talk to somebody who can. And if you have concern, you have to let that go. Do you have enjoyable and useful stress relief, reduction, and resiliency strategies? And what's the difference between these terms? So stress relief includes things that alleviate stress in the moment, like taking a bath, taking a short walk, going for a massage. Stress reduction is cutting back on the things that are actually causing the stress. Stress resiliency is actually developing and regularly using a practice of relaxation methods and other tools to build your ability to tolerate stress. So that might include meditation, yoga, or breathing exercises. As a part of your self-care plan, consider creating containment for each day by being intentional with beginnings and endings. So as the day begins, think about what are my intentions? Where will I place my focus today? And how will I measure success? At the end of the day, ask yourself, what can I put down? With what am I ready to be done? And what don't I need to carry with me another day? 
So let's consider some meditative or mindfulness practices that can be used during the fourth phase of the cycle of caring to center, ground, release what's not yours, and prepare to engage again. We could start with the breath. And I'd actually like you to practice this if you can, since we're kind of all in our own spaces, so it's pretty easy to do. You always have your breath and your body, and this is a great place to start for grounding and stress reduction. Before beginning breath work, feel free to blow your nose if you need to, close the door, or do whatever you need to do to get comfortable for the exercise. We'll begin with a quick four, seven, eight breathing, which I'm gonna walk you through just as a really easy tool to use for grounding or relaxation. We're going to be breathing in through our nose for a count of four, holding the breath for a count of seven, and then breathing out for a count of eight. We'll do it a couple of rounds, and then I'm gonna, and I'm gonna count it out for you so you know what's going on. So take a breath in and let that breath out. And now I'd like you to breathe in for a count of one, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four, five, six, seven, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, in, two, three, four, hold it, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Breathe normally. All you have to remember are the numbers four, seven, eight. Breathe in for four, hold it for seven, breathe out for eight. Just using the breath as a grounding exercise is always useful. As you become more comfortable with practicing intentional breathing, you can move into more meditation using the four found foundations of mindfulness. So the four foundations of mindfulness offer areas in which to bring focus while you're meditating. So you start with just breathing in and breathing out. You can use the four, seven, eight. You can just breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold, breathe in, hold, breathe out. And then you can start thinking about the body sensation, right? So understand what's going on in my body. What do I feel? Just noticing just understanding and just feelings, pure sensation. The second foundation is feeling tone, which is really just positive, I'm sorry, is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral, not positive or negative. Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. No thoughts about what that means, just whether something is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The, oh, sorry. Sorry, now I can't see my notes. It's surely breathing. Uh, and then the third foundation of mindfulness is your mind, which is about pleasure or aversion. So that pleasant or unpleasant feeling, is that making you happy? Is that making you angry? Is that distressing? Is that soothing? And then the fourth field of mindfulness or objects of mind or thoughts, which is really about what's coming up for you around this. So given the time, I'm not gonna run through an actual meditation because this can be a little longer, but you get the idea that you're starting with what's going on in my body, how, what sensations are happening. Is that pleasant or unpleasant? Is that making me want more of it or to not want it? And then what do I think about that? What comes up around that? And as you do this over time, you can pick one, you can do all four, you can do any combination of these. And I'm happy to send scripts to people for how to walk through this if you'd like one after the training. So Rumi was a 13th century Sufi mystic poet, and his poem, The Guest House, is one of my favorites to use for contemplative practice, reading through the poem and allowing ourselves to ponder what it means to us. Again, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to walk through this with you, but the idea is to, again, breathing in, breathing out, relaxing the body, sitting nice and comfortable, and then reading through some type of poetry or something that brings meaning that you can ponder and allow it to bring up things internally that you can then get. There are many apps and websites that have guided meditations to use. This is a simple two-minute breathing technique to calm and focus the mind. 
Breathing in and out in equal lengths of time tends to have a focusing effect. The four, seven, eight breathing that we did earlier, that calms the system. That's good for maybe the end of the day or after something very stressful or when you're trying to sleep. This type of breathing, we call it box breathing because you're making a box of breathing in, holding it, breathing out, holding it, breathing in. Um, it's good for focusing and starting the day. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. It's just two minutes long and We'll see how that is, so that you can see there are other, my voice isn't great for everybody. So everybody has different things they can listen to and we will try this one if it works. A great resource and using something that has water or natural landscape also helps to settle the body. Sorry. <laughs> There's also metta meditation which is a loving kindness meditation. This is a concentration practice. Also not going to run through this one but you have the script here. What you would be doing is breathing in and breathing out allowing yourself to relax and then using these lines may you be safe and protected May you be healthy and strong. May you be truly happy. May your mind be at ease. First, while you're picturing someone who's easy to love, then again with someone who's neutral that you don't have strong feelings of about either way, and then with someone who's a little bit more difficult to love, and then with yourself, and then with the world. You can interchange people, and it's a great way to use the people that are very easy to have nice, relaxing, warm feelings about to connect with the people that are a little bit more difficult to connect with. And then, so Tonglen, sorry, my view is weird. Tonglen meditation is another type of meditation that I think is particularly important for those in the helping fields. It's Tonglen means sending and taking, and it's a compassion building meditation. So the idea is that with it, each in breath, we take in the other's pain, and with each out breath, we send them relief. This is the opposite of what we often do, which is to avoid pain and suffering. This type of meditation awakens compassion. Seeing others in pain often triggers our own experience of fear and suffering, so we look away. It is only by really opening up to others in pain and connecting that with our own experiences of suffering, building compassion for ourselves and others, that we can begin to really change things. Tonglen meditation helps us to begin to be present in a compassionate yet detached way when we encounter suffering. And it is a great tool for that fourth phase of the cycle of caring. So this one I am gonna walk through because I'd like you to have this to take with you. So I'd like you to sit comfortably and breathe in and rest your mind for a moment. Then breathe out, breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in again and allow yourself to open to basic spaciousness and clarity and breathe out. And begin with breathing in feelings of heaviness and breathe out feelings of light. Breathe in for all of the helpers and caregivers who feel overwhelmed and breathe out confidence in our ability to meet the needs of our loved ones. Breathe in for all the helpers and caregivers who feel depleted and breathe out energy and rejuvenation. Breathe in the loneliness of disconnection and breathe out the sense of togetherness we all seek. And breathe in, breathe out, and come back to here and now. Tonglen meditation is a great way to learn to hold difficult things in compassion. It gives us space 
to really begin to hold difficult things in our heart, which begins to provide more resilience in the face of difficult things. So while I encourage everyone to build meditative practice into their daily routines and particularly into the fourth phase of the cycle of caring as a way to begin to reboot our systems for re-engagement with situations requiring helpers, I believe that the distress we experience through the helping profession requires us to build community care into our systems of care. As Jamil Zaki says here, it would seem crazy to tell someone with a physical injury or illness to walk it off. And it's just as ridiculous to tell those with emotional or moral injuries to just engage in self-care. We must also be prepared to support each other as we take care of ourselves. Community care must be built into the systems we live and work in. What is community care? So compliments, compliments, compliments genuine gratitude for the work we all do together, authentic feedback, empathetic listening, encouraging others to maintain self-care practices, checking in regularly with our, with our colleagues, take, encouraging folks to take respite when they need it, and ongoing support groups. Never underestimate the power of good morning texts, apologies, and random compliments as a way to take care of each other. The core of community care, in my opinion, is embodied in this quote. To love someone is to learn the song in their heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten it. We as a system must remind each other of what we forget when we are overwhelmed by the trauma we witness. Through understanding the cycle of caring, the need for a full phase to regroup, reconnect with our inner world and to process our experiences as helpers, we can begin to relieve ourselves of the burden of thinking that we can do it all ourselves. Our ability to do the work sustainably is based in our willingness to recognize the enormity of the task, the importance of caring for ourselves and each other, and doing it over and over again. So I'll leave you with this thought before we do questions if there's time. This is from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Jesse. That was just awesome. What a great presentation. So we would like um, now to open up the workshop for questions. If you have any questions, please post them on the social wall for this session to the right-hand side of your screen. When posting on the social wall, please be aware that there is a 20 to 30 second delay between the presentation and the stream on conference tracker. So please be patient as we review your questions and comments. If so, do anyone have any questions? I can just say, Jesse, that um, compassion fatigue, fatigue, I can really identify with. And when you said, shared an addictive behavior is that uncontrollable shopping. <laughs> I got you. You hit me. You really <laughs> hit me. <laughs> and yeah. so it's like, oh, this is compensating for this, you know, so. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Are there any questions, anyone? I have a that question. silence response you shared, um, I hadn't thought about it. And I think I do it unconsciously, you know. Absolutely, so absolutely. Was, yeah, that was good. I, I, I cleaned so much from your um, presentations. Oh, good, I'm um, glad. The first time we listened to you, I've been doing that four, seven, eight. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we have a question of what do you think is the best place to start for self-care? Ooh, that's a really good question. I, I mean, I think the best place to start is where you are, right? So I, I think thinking about where are you seeing, eh, maybe there's two answers, where do you see the most distress and how do you start addressing that, but also kind of what's the low hanging fruit to, to doing something like a four, seven, eight breathing before you go to bed, right? Doing that containment exercise where you think about what do I want to do today? What can I be done with? 
those are things that you can really implement in your day. I, I think just by asking that question, mm -hmm. um, that means somebody is ready to start, right? Recognizing that you need to take care of yourself to be able to take right. care of others is a huge, huge shift. Right, right. Awesome. That was a good question. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, seems like we don't have any more questions. Um, next workshop, everyone will begin at 1120. Be sure to check out NAMI Land and other amazing virtual resources in our virtual exhibitor hall. Don't forget to practice to participate in our resource scavenger hunt. If you find all the resources listed and submit your answers by the end of the conference, you'll be entered in a raffle to win a DSW messenger bag. And thank you everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>